Let's now continue to build our machine of bank zero over here. And I'll let you introduce one more variable to address another requirements. Let's now see which requirement we are trying to address over here. Okay, let's now go back to our requirements documents. And what I want to address will be the bank's total over here, right? This is something I already said I'm gonna do it, but I haven't done it yet, right? So this will be some variable I would like, well, I would like to keep track. Whenever you want to, for example, withdraw some money into a certain account, that should at the same time increase the cash flow, uh, or like a cash drawer for that particular bank, right? Or similarly, whenever you want to withdraw some money from a certain account, that means the cash drawer should become smaller as well, right, symmetrically. Let's now take a look to see how we can do this. And what I want to do over here is to define uh, over here, let's introduce another variable. You can just put your cursor right beside variables because we want to add under that. Right click on that, and then we want to add a variable over here. And the variable is going to be the drawer, the cash drawer. So let's call it D just for short, all right? And of course, as soon as we do that over here, if I say save, is it gonna compile? Well, it's not gonna compile because the D is lacking a type, right? You can see under the errors over here, we have done this for a few times already. Hopefully you're comfortable with it. And let me just put a comments over here. To the right of the uh, green arrow, let's now say the cash drawer or the total cash flow, either way. And what should that refer to? That should be referring to requirements number seven over here about the bank's total, right? Requirements number seven. Let's also make a note over here. So that'll be requirements uh, number seven over here, and then save. All right, of course, we still got, I need to really uh, uh, get a typing constraint, right? And to really get a typing constraint, so now we can do something similar to uh, what we did before. And there's something I want to mention, and uh, you can definitely try it on your own, okay? You, uh, whenever you introduce a new variable, there's another way for you to do it. For example, if you go uh, besides the variable, you can see on over here, we got several options over here. Let me go over them with you. You can either create a new event inside the machine. You can create a new invariance. You can also create a new variance, which we, we don't really do for this lab. And also you can create a new variable. And if you click on that over here, you will see uh, the convenience about using a wizard is not only that you will declare the name of the variable, but you can specify its initialization and also invariance uh, and also the typing constraint right away, which is good, right? Remember, we did all these three things uh, for the variable B earlier, but we're going to do it separately. I personally prefer actually doing it separately uh, because that kind of uh, uh, give me a very clear picture about what's going to, uh, wh which part should be which. But if you want to do, do that uh, at one go, no problem. All right, why don't I do it together with you just to, to show, All right? So uh, I can definitely undo what I did already, I, I think. Control Z, undo the creation of this variable, right? So now I'm here, right? Undo, Control Z, like a normal programming. And Control S, just to save everything, everything's good. Let me now re uh, reintroduce the same variable in a different way. You can move your cursor either under variables or maybe uh, besides the machine, doesn't matter, all right? And now you can see the wizard over here. I want you to choose this one here, the new uh, variable wizard. This one over here, right? Don't click on the wrong one. They look kind of similar, All right? Click on that yellow one. And then the variable I want to have is the D over here, all right? And then you can see very cleverly, initialization is gonna be uh, action number two because we got action number one already. So that's why I said don't modify the default label. So the system can keep track of them uh, for you automatically. So let's say the cash drawer, let's say initially, oh, what should be the cash drawer? So maybe initially just zero, right? Because all the balance initially will just be zero. If you remember over here, we said uh, over here, uh, let me try to locate uh, over here. All the balance initially will just be zero. So initially the sum of all the balances should just be zero, of course, right? That's why I put zero over here. I'm reflecting what the uh, um, requirement has set. And over here, what should be the typing? What should be the type for the D? In that case, it should be, uh, well, it's like a, a sum of the money, right? Some of the uh, accounts, maybe eventually they will get to some negative, but still larger than or equal to the minus uh, credit limits, as we said. So it can be just integer, so INT, all right? And then space, you will see the Z symbol here. All right, let's say, okay. 
Once you say that, you can see we got three things over here. We got a variable decoration for its name. We got a typing constraint over here, which is uh, an axiom. Awesome. And also we got an initialization. We got all three things uh, done at one go. If you really prefer this way, by all means, be my guest. All right. And here, uh, we just need to put the comments over here. Cache drawer. All right. And then it should be, uh, we did it before. It should be requirements number seven. And if you like to put some notes about why it should be zero, you can also put it's according to requirements number four that we actually uh, set all the initial balances for the uh, account should be zero, right? Initially, right? If you look at requirements number four, it should be zero over here. All right. So that's a new variable we introduced. And now we want to introduce one more construct, which is called the events. There are two different ways for creating an event uh, into a machine. And I would like to show you both of them. The first one is actually without the use of a wizard, like how we use the wizard to actually create a variable, right? We don't want to use any wizard to create events. That means we're going to create uh, using different clicks, uh, which is fun. Let me show you the first way, and then I'll show you the second way as well. All right, let's now go under the machine, put your cursor around here after the machine, right click, and then add events over here. And think about initialization like a special event without any guard. In that case, you will always execute all the actions over here unconditionally. But now for any events over here, you can think about it's like how you define or declare a Java method. So what do you have to put in the Java method? Let's say it's a mutator, like a, uh, like a returning void. What should you do uh, for method? You got to declare any input parameter if necessary. And also you're going to specify the actions. And also you want to specify under, uh, under what circumstances is your, uh, is your method uh, going to throw some exception. But we don't really have the concept about exceptions in Rodent uh, in the event B notation. We, don't, we only got a notion about guard. So the fundamental difference between uh, guard and exception, let me just say something very quickly, right? You can draw the analogy, but you want to make sure you know the difference between guard and also exception. Okay, so when we talk about event B, which is the modeling notation that we are learning in this course, okay, and also we talk about the Java programming, right? Just don't forget, event B is actually for modeling. Java is for programming. And for the event B, we actually got something called event, of course. And for Java, we got methods, right? And for the case of events, we we have uh, of course input. Uh, we got event parameters and also uh, similar to the input parameters for methods. Let me uh, skip that part. Let me say guards. Okay, and then we also got methods. Also, we got something called preconditions. And the way you implement preconditions by using exceptions, right? If, for example, the input happened to be Negative, in that case, you might throw some input to small exception, right? So far, so good. And the fundamental difference between guards and preconditions are quite important, right? In the case of guards over here, if it is true, that means the event is enabled to invoke or to execute. If it is false, that means the event is simply just disabled. They just cannot be invoked. Okay? So there's no exception being thrown in the system, which means the system does not crash. The worst case you might have is so-called deadlock situation where all the events are simply disabled. Right? Let me just mention that term. But we're going to talk cover that term as well later. So there is a situation called deadlock when all the events are disabled. Meaning that the guard, the guard, the guarding constraint for all the events are simply false at that particular moment for the system. All right. That's something we'll definitely see later uh, when we cover in the lecture. All right. And what about preconditions using exception? That's also important for you to know the, uh, the, uh, what's, how, how this going to work. If the precondition is simply true, in that case, method will just be executed. 
if the precondition is actually false, in that case, basically program crashes and then you actually got exception thrown. Of course, you may choose to handle the exception in a particular way, but I'll just say exception thrown. But there's no co such concept as uh, exceptions in the case of a modeling, like in event B, there's no, right? Exceptions are only a programming concept. All right, it's a very important distinction for you to make. So what we're gonna do now is to talk about events in the event B. That's what we're gonna talk about. And then specifically, we're gonna see how you can specify guards, all right? Which will be a Boolean conditions, okay? Let's now go back. And we're gonna do the events, right? So let's now give the event a name. And you can just go back over here, right? Just make sure you go to the editing area for the events. Let's now give a name for the events. And we just want to do one event, and then the other ones I'll leave that as, uh, as an exercise for you, okay? So let's call the events withdraw. And what does this correspond to? And by the way, you can see over here, it says extend extend the ordinary don't change it right just leave it the way it is i'm going to show to you uh how to really change it to uh, cr uh maybe for different settings maybe later right for now don't worry about it okay just for withdraw and i'm going to put some comments over here about uh where it came from right so if you go back to the ipad notes over here and if you go back to our requirements documents over here and it's exactly requirements number six over here or we talk about the withdrawal from some account right so that's the one we want to. So what we're going to do is uh, requirements number six. Requirements number six over here. And then let's now save it. All right. Everything is good. Uh, except that extend with uh, extended event withdraw not a refinement. Okay. In that case, we, we got to change it. Okay. So make sure you click on that and make sure it's not extended. Right. So basically extended is actually only for refinements, which we don't do in this particular tutorial. So you want to make sure it's not extended, right? Click on that to show it, make sure it's not extended, right? And then control space, uh, control S, right? Goes away. As I promise, I will explain to you the difference between not extended versus extended later when we talk about refinement, all right? So you don't need to worry about, uh, just take it for granted just for now. All right, so we're going to put some uh, parameters because withdraw, we should know which account to really withdraw and also which uh, balance to uh, which uh, amount to really withdraw. I would like to talk a little bit about how exactly we should plan out the events so it will be easier for you. Let's say we talk, uh, remember we got the balance over here being a partial function, right? Let me start from that. Let me start an empty page to talk about how we can think of the uh, withdraw events. Okay, let me just add a, get an empty page, okay? Let's say, uh, just for example, let's say we got this particular balance function. Right? Remember, balance is actually a member of a partial function between accounts and also integer, right? That's what we said. You can definitely double check on your model over there. And then let's now talk about exactly. One example bank could be, uh, it's a relation, a set of pairs. So ACC1, and also, let's say we already got 240, okay? Account and also integer, right? Let me just to, uh, put uh, a few. Account number two, minus 23, which will, will be okay as long as it's larger than or equal to the minus credit, uh, credit limits. And also we got account number three. Over here, let's say uh, 46, okay? That's enough. Let's say we got three accounts in the bank. So we got the balance function, the domain of the balance over here is simply the three accounts, ACC1, ACC2, and also ACC3. What does it really mean? If I want to withdraw, let's say I want to withdraw, let's say, for example, let's say uh, withdraw $10 from ACC2. All right, let's say this is what I want to do. Conceptually, what I want to do over here is to say rather than minus 23, it's going to be uh, withdraw another 10 minus 33. Let's assume that it's still within the credit limits. Let's assume that. All right, that's what I want to achieve. But what kind of uh, 
operation should I perform mathematically, right? And you can, well, let me, uh, you can now, uh, before I let you pause the video, I'll give you a little bit of hints. This is actually a partial function, right? It's a partial function. But don't forget, every function is still a relation. And I would like you to pause the video now and think about if what I want to do is to change this particular one by my uh by minus ten. What kind of a relation or operation can I choose to do so? You may choose a multiple one and combine them together. Right? That's something I would like you to think about. You can feel free to refer back to the notes uh, of your math review lecture, but I will let you to pause the video and think about it. All right. Assuming that you thought about it, the answer is you may use the relational overriding operator because a function is also a relation. So you definitely can use it. Okay. How, how do we use it? The way to use it is you can think about the B over here, right? It's going to be overridden with, right? Remember that's a relational overriding symbol from your uh, week number two uh, math review lecture. All right. And then it's going to be overridden by another relation, which will just be a set of pair. And the only thing we want to change is about the balance over here for that particular account, for this particular account, right? And then we want to change it to be whatever it is, minus 10. That's why we want to withdraw, right? In that case, I'm going to say something like this. It's going to be, uh, going to be something, something like, it's going to be uh, overridden by ACC2. That's the account that we want to uh, withdraw from. And then what should be the uh, the the the, uh, the new balance over here, which will be the original one minus ten. So that will be uh, b with functional application, right? It's a function. Uh, it's a uh, function, so you can do function application. And the difference between function application versus relational image, please refer to your lecture uh, week number two. It is also discussed. So I'm going to say b apply with a c c two. So that would basically give you the original minus 23, but you want a minus 10. So minus 10, this will be whatever amount that we want to withdraw, right? So this will be basically the uh, answer. However, Rodan know that uh, Rodan realizes, recognizes that this kind of pattern actually occurs very often. So they give you some syntactic shortcut, but I would say up to here, you should really understand about why this pink one over here is going to achieve whatever we are trying to do conceptually over here by withdrawing $10. Make sure you understand that first. And in Rodan, what you can write conveniently is like this. Okay, in Rodan. And that's exactly what we're going to do when we try to uh, implement a withdrawal. So we will write B, the function applied to this particular domain value that we want to change, ACC2, is substituted by this particular expression. B, ACC2, the original value before the withdraw, minus 10. So this part over here is what you can write in Rodan. Okay, this part in the orange. But you should know that this corresponds to this formal relational overriding. And we are talking about a special case of the relational overriding where the right-hand side relation is only a singleton set, meaning that it's only a single pair with a domain value. You can simply put a domain value. Okay, let's, you can definitely see the correspondence, right? You can think about ACC2 is corresponding to this ACC2. And also this expression over here is really about a new value that particular domain value should really take to map, right? That's uh, the correspondence you should see. Of course, you can feel free to also try to specify this particular expression in Rodan if you want to, but I think this one is much more convenient, all right? That's something I would like to uh, talk about before we actually uh, write it.